I was telling our Bible study group uh, today about the summers I used to spend up at Ridgecrest, which was the conference center for Southern Baptists for so many years up in North Carolina. My dad used to teach on the faculty there, and we would go and uh, spend several weeks during the summer, Sunday school week or missions week, some of those, those kinds of things. Um, my mother's mother, uh, my grandmother, was uh, battling cancer. And on occasion, she would come over to Atlanta and uh, would undergo treatments. Well, on one of those trips up to the Ridgecrest, she went with us. With that background, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, when we were there, we'd always go to these classes. And it was funny because they depend on volunteers from all over the basically the southeast to to help uh, teach classes for children and for youth. And um, I guess they were a little worried about us because, uh, you know, they keep us under pretty tight control. Uh, what they love to do after they would, you know, feed us with that unsweetened Kool-Aid and those stale graham crackers. <clears throat> um, then they take us on nature walks. Well, they would tie us together because they were afraid we'd break loose, I guess. And they'd have several wardens who uh, would stay with the prisoners as we made our way through the, the grounds at Ridgecrest. And on one occasion, we walked uh, outside the, the grounds a little ways where there were some uh, cabins in the woods uh, where people were staying who would attend the conference. Well, we were staying at a friend's cabin there, and as we were making our way through the woods and the wardens were guiding us and keeping us in line, cracking the whip, um, I looked up and I, I recognized where we were. We were near the cabin where uh, we were staying, and I knew my grandmother was sitting there on the porch where she did every morning. She would use her handwork, uh, work with that, and then also she'd read her Bible. She loved reading her Bible. And she sat in a rocking chair and would spend most of the morning out there. And uh, I knew she'd be there. So I'm walking alongside and I'm chained to this little kid. I don't remember where he's from. But um, I looked over at him and I said, uh, I'll bet you a million dollars that my grandmother lives in these woods. And he just, you know, you, you, you're, you're kidding. You're lying. I said, no, I'm not. I bet you a million dollars that she's living here in these woods. And so after a few moments, we... Uh, you know, we're snaking along the trail there and we come to this clearing and I look up and there's our cabin and there's my grandmother uh, sitting on the porch reading her Bible. And um, I look over at my friend and I said, uh, I told you that my grandmother is living in these woods. And about that time, my grandmother saw me and she says, oh, hello, Mark. I hope you're having fun this morning. Well, this little guy next to me just burst into tears. And um, before long, one of the wardens came over to see what I had done to him. You know, I had punched him or called his mom a name or something. I don't know. But um, the teacher finally ca calmed him down enough. And he said, I don't have a million dollars. She had no idea what he was talking about, but I did. You know what? I've never seen a cent of that money in all this time. Well, the reason I tell you that silly story is is to make this a little more personal, and that is uh, my grandmother was one of the most uh, gentle uh, people I'd ever known. Uh, she was in intense pain from her cancer, but she always had a smile on her face, and she had this calm demeanor about her. I knew that that was part of her personality, but also knew that a lot of her confidence came from her dependence on the Word of God. One of her favorite... Uh, uh, passages in scripture was the 23rd Psalm. She'd read it. She'd quote it. Um, she even knew some songs to it. it. It was just one of those passages that had meant so much to her through the years. And I can still hear her voice um, as I read those words, so familiar, those six verses about the Lord, our shepherd. Um, she succumbed to cancer not long after that. But my memory of her is not her pain and her struggle but her faith, her enduring faith that kept her strong in the midst of her challenges. She had lost her husband uh, earlier. Um, my grandfather was an interesting man. He was an educator like she was, and he had um, served a number of years as a principal. And um, he had this rule on the faculty of, of the school where he taught. And it, the rule was that um, he didn't want anybody dating in, in the faculty. He didn't want 
anybody, um, you know, having a romantic liaison with one of the other teachers or whatever. Um, I, we thought that was interesting because uh, he ended up marrying one of the school teachers, my grandmother, who was 18 young, years younger than he was. But um, she was a remarkable woman. And um, that psalm has always been one of my favorites simply because it was one of hers. A little girl was asked once to recite the 23rd Psalm. She got up in front of a, a crowd of folks and um, she started and she said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. And then she sat down. Well, I thought she captured it pretty well. The Lord is my shepherd. That's all I need. That's all I want. You think about those six verses, and this isn't new to anybody that's uh, familiar with the passage, but um, David was a shepherd, and he knew uh, how a shepherd's supposed to operate. He knew how to take care of sheep. He knew how to protect them from poisonous plants and from predators. Uh, he knew how, how to calm them down when they were troubled. He knew all, of, all the secrets because he spent so much time with them. He would sing his songs. Um, he wrote himself, as we'd see in the Bible and the book of Psalms. There are many of those there. Um, but he, he had that kind of a way about a sheep that he understood how to take care of an animal that was almost helpless. Um, it, it, it couldn't defend itself at all. And you get that picture when you read those six verses and you realize that we really need a shepherd because the Bible often refers to us as sheep and sheep go astray. They wander off uh, and they don't know how to get back. And in fact, once they get lost, they will ultimately lose the ability to stand on their own and they'll just lay down and they won't be able to get up and they are easy prey for a predator or they'll just starve or die from exposure. That's why we often see that picture of Jesus with a lamb across his shoulders, uh, Jesus bearing that lamb to safety. And uh, again, this is not, not necessarily new to so many of us because I'm sure I've talked about it as well. But um, shepherds understood their livelihood depending on taking care of the sheep. And you could have a hundred sheep, but if one went missing, just like Jesus spoke about the parable in Luke 15, he would leave the sheep, the larger number of the sheep in the fold where other shepherds could take care of them while he was gone looking for the lost sheep. And he would keep looking until he found it and bring it back. So you get this image. Uh, Jesus used that image to describe the church, the, the followers of, of Jesus, uh, that we're much like sheep. We, we need a shepherd desperately. Much of John chapter 10 is about that and how the shepherd will do anything he can, has to do to protect his sheep. He will lay down. He will become the gate. And then Jesus says, I am the gate. Uh, he will, um, he, with the cost of his life, he'll protect his sheep. Um, and sheep uh, have a way, even if they're not the brightest of animals, they have a way of recognizing their own shepherd. Um, as I said, David often sang to his sheep, they would recognize his voice. Jesus mentions that in John 10 when he says that sheep will recognize the, the voice of their shepherd and will not go to another. Um, and that was the way that they would begin a new day with um, a communal fold and a number of flocks gathered together in the same pen. Uh, the shepherds would stand outside the gate and they would make whatever noise or sound they'd sing or call or whistle and their sheep would come to them. And so Jesus used that to say that his sheep, those of his time, those who were following him then and those sheep that were yet to come, you and I would recognize his voice and would only follow him. I, I hope that's, that's true in all of our lives, that we'd only follow the voice of Christ. Well, in the Psalm, um, the shepherd is writing about the good shepherd, and he writes about the things that a good shepherd does. And uh, you, you'll remember those verses, and I'm just going to read them. Just reflect. Just close your eyes and reflect for a moment. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those familiar words, um, perhaps the most familiar words, uh, six verses in the entire Bible. Many people know this, this psalm. I remember a story 
about a famous actor who had come back home and they were throwing a big party for him and um, invited to the party was uh, the old minister of the of the town. Everybody knew him and he'd been there forever. And um, this actor had made his way on, on Broadway and was well known, you know, across the world. The uh, the hostess of the party uh, prevailed upon the actor, if he would, to recite the twenty third Psalm, and um, he was he was honored to do that. He was willing to do it, and he used his best theater, best theater voice and uh, quoted the twenty third Psalm. He had learned it as a boy. In fact, he probably had learned it from the old minister. And after he finished, the, the actor looked over and saw the uh, old man who had. He'd been a shepherd to the community for so many years, and he said, you know, um, why don't you let him recite it too? And the hostess, not wishing to insult or offend, agreed, of course, and asked the minister if he would. And uh, he reluctantly agreed. How do you compete with a worldwide, a world-famous actor? But the old man began and spoke those words, those same words that the actor had said just a few moments before. Uh, at the conclusion of the actor's rendition, uh, people clapped. After the minister finished, it was quiet. And the actor said, um, you know, um, I know the psalm about the shepherd, but he knows the shepherd. Uh, what a great tribute that we would know the shepherd. And in that, uh, that familiar passage, the first few verses tell us about what the shepherd does. But then the next portion tells us who the shepherd is. Uh, it starts off talking about he. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores me. But then we get to the middle there when it says, even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death. The shadow of death um, is a scary place. And it's uh, dark and we can feel almost claustrophobic under circumstances where we feel so pressed in and overwhelmed. Uh, but uh, all of us go through that valley. But what the Bible teaches us is that we go through it. We don't stay there. And in order to get to the high pasture, we have to go through the valley. And as I mentioned before, um, this is a beautiful picture of a shepherd who knows exactly what his sheep needs. And he, and he takes them to a place where they're absolutely safe. Uh, he provides for them um, in ways that are very personal and intimate. A shepherd would uh, examine his sheep as they came back into the fold after a day out into the, into the brush and pasture, and he would examine them to make sure that they were not hurt in any way. And if, if they were hurt, he would use uh, a calming and soothing oil uh, on their wounds. Um, he always made sure that the sheep had plenty, plenty to eat, plenty to drink. My cup overflows. Um, but then at the very end, we have another image, and that is this one. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Somebody have, has said, well, those, those are the two sheepdogs, goodness and mercy. Uh, we need that to make sure that when we bump up against the rough spots of life, there's somebody there to guide us, keep us on track, um, that his goodness and mercy shall be a part of his um uh, contribution to our existence. But then there's another picture. All the days of my life, my journey on earth. But then there's this one. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That to me suggests that the high pasture is not of this earth. It's something far better. My grandmother knew that. And when she said those words, she was looking toward heaven. She knew that one day, and it was soon, that she would rejoin her husband and other loved ones who'd gone on before. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing her again. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere there's not a rocking chair sitting on a porch and a beautiful woman sitting there with her handwork and her Bible. And there again, just claiming the promise, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God bless you.